All right, guys, so let's take a look at ch chapter 17, which is going to be neurologic emergencies um, for you guys. So the three biggest things that we're going to talk about with the neurologic chapter are going to be strokes, seizures, and altered mental status for a variety of causes. Now, some of these things you will be able to intervene and some of them you won't. Um, so we're just keeping that in mind as we move forward that sometimes there's not a lot that we can do for, um, for these issues, but recognizing them and getting the patient to definitive treatment is the best option. Let's look at some anatomy and physiology really quickly. So the brain, of course, is the body's computer, and that controls breathing, speech, and all other bodily functions. And the three major parts of that brain are the brainstem, the cerebellum, and the cerebrum. And you're going to see some test questions that ask about this. So let's take a look at it on a picture. Now, the cerebrum is, of course, the largest part. And you see um, there the brainstem which is attached to the spinal cord. We know that the spinal cord is simply just an extension off of that brainstem, and that's why it needs so much protection. The cerebellum is much smaller in comparison to the cerebrum, and it also houses some very important functions as well. So while the brainstem controls our basic functions of life, the cerebellum controls your muscle and body coordination. And that's pretty much what we just said right there. Remembering that brain stem, that's going to be what controls your blood pressure, your heart rate, your breathing. So most basic functions, any type of damage to that area is going to be life-threatening. Now, we said that the spinal column is just an extension off of that brain stem. And so we need that for messages to be able to continue to be sent to and from the brain. And so you have cranial nerves and spinal nerves, and these are all connected to send the body messages from the brain and out to the rest of the body and vice versa. So remember where we talked about our sensory nerves that we're going to sense if something is too hot or too cold or if it's painful, and it's gonna send that message up to the brain, and then the brain is gonna send a message back down and move the body in response to that. And that's how this happens is through all of these nerves. So every single nerve that branches out throughout the entire body is connected back to this spinal cord in some form or fashion. Some larger nerves, some smaller, but all of them connecting back. So that's very important that we understand how that actually works. There's a lot of different disorders that can cause brain dysfunction, and some can affect the level of consciousness, speech, and other voluntary muscle control. The brain is very sensitive to changes in oxygen, glucose, and temperature. And remember, the body is always trying to stay in homeostasis. So when it doesn't have enough of one of these things or one of these things is altered, it's gonna have some type of change. So when we don't have enough oxygen, which we would call hypoxia, we're gonna have an altered mental status in response once it falls to a certain level. Same thing with glucose. If the body doesn't have enough glucose, and that we call that hypoglycemia, then we're gonna have an altered mental status in response to that. In regards to temperature, the body has a very small window where it can operate. And so normal body temperature is gonna be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, that's textbook. Some people may run just a little bit hotter, a little bit cooler, and that's you know what's normal for them. But um, when we start talking about more than a degree and a half, really, in either of those directions, too hot or too cold, then the body is not going to respond to that change very well. And so you might start seeing some changes. So let's talk about one of the more common patient complaints related to neurologic disorders, and that could be headache. Now, the headache could be a sign or a symptom of other uh, something else going on inside of the body. Now, what do we mean sign or symptom? Of course, if they're telling us that their head is hurting, that they're experiencing a headache, that is a symptom. 
The physical signs that we could see that would indicate the patient might be having a headache would be their withdrawal from light, okay? They squint their eyes or cover their eyes, things of that nature. So signs, physical signs that we can see. Now, only a small percentage of headaches are caused by a serious medical condition, but it is important that we be able to determine when that is so that we can intervene and provide the appropriate treatment when necessary. Now, there's a variety of different headaches out there, tension headaches, sinus headaches, things of that nature, sinus headache. If the patient bends forward, uh, bending over, that might cause an increase in pain just simply because of the change in pressure in that sinus cavity. But when we start talking about migraines, these are um, things that are really serious and people can actually be debilitated because of these headaches. So this is a real medical condition that does require treatment, usually long-term chronic treatment. For some people, it's just when the migraine occurs, but some people need to take medication every day to keep these migraines at bay. So usually this is described as a pounding, throbbing, or pulsating pain, often associated with nausea and vomiting and also visual changes. It can last for several hours or even days. So again, this condition can be very debilitating. So we want to ask the patient, do you have a history of migraines? Have you taken anything for it? Do you take prescription medication for it? Um, just turning off the lights or laying down feel better? Are you having any other signs or symptoms going along with this? as far as the nausea, vomiting, things of that nature. So things to consider with migraines. Now some red flags for headaches to let us know that this could uh, indicate an underlying more serious condition like a hemorrhagic stroke, brain tumor, or meningitis if they had a sudden onset of symptoms. Like usually migraines will start, they can feel that dull ache beginning. Um, but if this is a sudden onset of symptoms, that's, that's a, a red flag explosive or thunderclap pain, if they also have an altered mental status, if they're over 50 years old, and especially if they're over 50 years old and they take blood thinning medications or they've recently suffered a fall, particularly where they hit their head, those should be real concerns. If the patient already has a deep, uh, excuse me, depressed immune system, if they have any neurologic deficits, and those deficits are things that we're going to look at with our stroke screening. So if they have any type of arm drift or one-sided weakness or facial drooping or slurred speech, those are neurologic deficits that would definitely lead us to believe the patient is experiencing a stroke and not just a headache. Neck stiffness and pain, that's going to be more on the side of meningitis, so chin to chest, if there's pain with that, that's not normal. Fever, usually coupled hand in hand with that as well. And then changes in vision, or again, one-sided paralysis or weakness. So these are things that we're looking at for if they have a headache and they are complaining of these things or they have these other signs and symptoms that we believe something more serious is probably going on. So moving on to strokes. We can also call this a cerebrovascular accident or a CVA, and you're going to see those terms interchanged, and you're going to see test questions that ask about that, so you want to be really familiar with that term, CVA. Now, this means there's an interruption of blood flow to an area within the brain and can result in the loss of brain function. Now, there are two types of strokes, which we're going to get into here in just a second, and that's ischemic and hemorrhagic. And the ischemic stroke is coming because of a, most likely a blood clot, but something is blocking and obstructing the pathway of, of the blood flow, whereas the hemorrhagic stroke is actually a bleed within the brain. And so both of these are stopping blood flow from continuing on where it needs to be. But as we get into these, you'll see that the calls and the treatment are actually quite different. So ischemic strokes, these are the most common and um, these usually account for about 80% of strokes on average. And this results from a thrombosis or embolus, so usually a blood clot, like we said. These symptoms can range from nothing at all to complete paralysis. And atherosclerosis in the blood vessels can often be the cause. So again, that buildup of plaque inside of blood vessels, that can happen inside of the brain, not just the heart. We think about it being inside of the heart. And if it was somewhere else inside of the body, a piece of that plaque could break off, become lodged in the bloodstream, and it could travel up to the brain where it gets stuck and it can't pass anymore. And so we actually see tissue dying off past that point. So again, it could be plaque, it could be a blood clot um, that 
that's causing this to happen and they could experience a full range of symptoms. So that's one thing we're going to talk about how it's hard to differentiate what the cause of the stroke can be sometimes in the field without an MRI or a CT scan because the symptoms are the same. This is actually a picture here of what an ischemic stroke would look like. So you see that clot is actually lodged there and it is um, blocking off blood from the rest of the brain. And they're just showing you in that second picture there where the clot originated inside of the heart in this instance. It came in, uh, moved into the blood flow, bloodstream and it became lodged inside of the brain there. So keep this in mind when we start talking about TIAs or transient ischemic attacks in just a second because that, that's going to be uh, very important that you understand how this works because when that clot moves, we can see a change in symptoms. Now with hemorrhagic strokes, these account for about 13% and these uh, are cerebral hemorrhages and they can often unfortunately be fatal. Now there's a lot of risk factors for these and that includes bleeding disorders. So thinking about hemophilia where we have no ability to clot, so we just have increased bleeding. And patients who take blood thinning medications um, that are going to cause difficulty in clots forming. And patients who have had falls or really anywhere where they have had some type of potential for a head injury. So thinking about a motor vehicle accident, you have a patient, let's say they're around 50 years old, they take blood thinning medications and they were uh, in a motor vehicle accident and struck their head on the windshield. That right there alone is a trauma criteria, meaning that they need to be seen at an emergency department um, that is capable of handling strokes or traumatic incidents because even if they're not displaying signs and symptoms of a stroke right then, it could have caused a bleed and we not even realize it. So that's a big deal too because some of these bleeds can be slow and some of them can be really fast. When we start talking about um, rupture of aneurysms, because that is a type of hemorrhagic stroke, those often bleed really fast because they were already formed. You had a large accumulation of blood in that one area from the weakened vessels. But if this is just coming from damage that occurred today and a rupture of a small vessel, it could just be a small bleed. Now, if we let that bleed continue on, it could still become fatal. So we definitely want to get it checked out. Now let's look at TIAs, which are transient ischemic attacks. And remember I said this was very important to remember um, the ischemic stroke here because this can only preface an ischemic stroke. All right, so let me back up. TIAs are where you have stroke-like symptoms, but they go away on their own in less than 24 hours. And you're going to see some test questions that ask about that time frame, so you want to be aware of that. This could be a warning sign of a larger stroke to come and is considered an emergency, so your treatment should be the same. And let me be clear that when you see these signs and symptoms of a patient, there is absolutely no way to know in the field if this is a TIA and it's going to resolve itself or if it's going to be a large stroke that's causing that ischemic uh, brain tissue to accumulate. So we want to treat these patients the same, and that's with rapid transport is really the best that we can offer. Even at the paramedic level, there's not a lot of treatment that can be done in the field for either type of stroke, ischemic or hemorrhagic. In just a second, when we get into talking about the signs and symptoms, we'll see that they are usually the same. There's a few red flags that we can look at to lean one way or the other, and based off of the patient's history, that can help us lean one way or the other, but the treatment is the same, and it's really not up to us to determine what the cause was in the field. It's simply to get them to that definitive treatment. They need that CT scan or MRI to determine what's going on here. But the TIA can only preface the ischemic stroke because it is when that clot or piece of plaque moves moves, that that's when the symptoms resolve. So that can't happen with the hemorrhagic stroke, okay? The bleed doesn't just stop and then come back. So very important for you to remember, and you'll see several test questions that ask about that as well. When that clot or piece of plaque moves and blood flow is restored past that point, that's when the symptoms resolve. Now again, we still want to transport them to a stroke-capable facility because we, we're not sure and we have no way of knowing. There have been plenty of times in my career when I have transported patients to a stroke center um, with a code stroke alert only to their, for their symptoms to resolve prior to me getting to the hospital. But that doesn't mean that we should shouldn't have done that or that they don't need to be there. It just means that they most likely are experiencing a TIA and that clot has shifted, restoring blood flow, which is good for the patient because that blood flow has been restored. Now they know what's probably going on. They can go in and bust that clot up. All right, so I'm going to end this here and I'll catch you guys in part two of the video.